It feels like Ireland has been experiencing a perpetual housing crisis for decades now. The homelessness situation is the clearest evidence of the accommodation shortage, but it's not the only one. Our housing system is marked by a deepening sense of inequality and exclusion for many. In response, the government has pledged to deliver an average of 33,000 homes per year up to 2030 to address the housing crisis. Setting aside the questions of, is this goal ambitious enough or even can they deliver on this? Ireland is about to begin a sizeable building boom. But the failings of such large-scale housing schemes of the past have been well documented and have left a legacy of expensive regeneration projects across the country. As well as a legacy of major urban sprawl radiating out from our urban centres. This all raises big questions for housing and planning. As more and more families are pushed out across the road network, facing longer commutes and increased traffic congestion. This negatively affects quality of life and has harmful impacts on our environment. So what do we build and where do we build it? Some estimates to meet Ireland's housing needs run at building in the region of 200,000 new homes over the next three years, which is a tall order. In simple economic terms, supply is driven by demand, and nowhere in the country is the housing demand more acute than here in Dublin City. It's often touted that the solution to meet this demand is to build up and not out. But does this claim stack up? What, what should we be building in Ireland, ideally? Cork City could easily double in size over the next 30, 40, 50 years. Now, will it double out? Will it cover twice the area? Or will it maybe just double its height or double the use of its existing footprint? When you spread out further, you need a lot more car usage, or if you don't have car usage, you need to have pockets of people living in certain areas in order for transport systems to work like buses um, or indeed trains. But unfortunately, what we've seen is the construction of homes further and further away from where people go to school and where people go to work. When you come closer together, when you use the existing footprint of land better, um, you don't need that. And, and that's the benefits of being closer together mean that the carbon footprint is smaller, um, but also that life becomes cheaper. If you think about all the things we spend our money on, on healthcare or, or schools, and the same is true of water infrastructure as well, so, so you might think of it as utilities. The closer we live together, the cheaper those services become. And if you compare, say, Singapore, which has a population similar to Ireland, but it's, it's in, this, in a small island about the size of Dublin, and, and Ireland, which is much more spread out, Singapore can have one hospital that specialises in, say, spinal injuries or cancer and everyone can get to it. So they only need one specialist hospital and everyone can get there pretty quickly. If you do the same in Ireland, the travel times are a lot longer. And it's not to say we need to get everyone and force them into one big city in Ireland, but we need to be aware that when we choose to live far apart from each other, there are costs to that. And there may be costs we're happy to, to bear, but we need to take into account not just the cost to ourselves, but the cost to the environment as well. There's a lot of argument in, in cities, you know, Dublin, Cork, all over the country, about how high should we go. People who are already living there don't necessarily want massive high rises overlooking their properties, but then the argument is, but we need them. So how high do we go? If you go to cities like Bilbao or other cities in, in Europe and they have six or eight stories everywhere. So there's lots of small cafes and boutiques and everything all on the ground floor all across the city. Unfortunately, the vast majority of Irish cities are two stories, in some cases one story, in some cases maybe a little bit more, but on average two stories. So if we want to average out at six or eight, the stuff we build would have to be taller. 
Now, I appreciate that when somebody comes along and says, I'm going to build 18 stories just down the road from you and you're in two stories, that firstly, there's an element of change. People fear change. It's a kind of an innate human thing. But also you worry about who are these new people going to be? Is it going to change the neighborhood? If we're fighting new development, we're fighting future generations. So do we want to provide homes for the next generation, for our own children? Because if we do, we need to be a lot more in favor of, of building new homes in our own neighborhoods. Otherwise, you're just pushing them down, further down the motorway network and further away from where their daily lives are. Building up to increase density in city centres is economically more efficient, as it means shorter commutes and easier access to services. This makes public services provision cheaper, and it all leads to a lower carbon footprint. Makes sense, right? However, these advantages are not without their challenges. With space in our urban areas at such a premium, I wonder how welcoming established communities will be to high-rise developments on their doorstep. So, Joe, in 2017, there was a plan to develop this whole area, is that right? Yeah. There was going to be one uh, tall tower put in the centre of the site and lots of other, you know, medium to low to medium rise buildings, about 1,500 homes altogether. And it was, you know, unanimously supported by everybody in the community. For many years, the community in Dublin 8 have campaigned for the development of two adjacent disused industrial sites. But in a strange twist of fate, the community now finds itself embroiled in a legal battle to stop a strategic housing development that was granted by Onboard Planola to US property giant Heinz. So in 2017, the community were on board with development. They wanted 100%. houses here. Yeah, you would have had proper community engagement, you would have had multiple meetings, and most importantly, the councillors would have been involved. So tell me, when did this change? So the first planning application that went in was in 2020, and the first thing that went in was a 15-storey tower, and that was swiftly followed by an application for a 22-storey tower, and not just one of them, basically a wall of towers. So an entire change to the skyline. And as a community, we were just horrified. With the growing housing crisis, the last government introduced Strategic Housing Development Legislation, or SHD. The idea was to fast-track the planning process of large developments. Applications went directly to onboard Planola for decision, and these decisions could not be appealed. The hope was to boost the number of homes built. We are being told that we need more houses, we mm, need more please. homes, and there is yeah. a housing crisis. Yeah. Do we not want to try and get as many homes onto this site as we can? Basically, one of the big things is an entire build-to-rent um, development. So there's no units for sale, you've no mix of tenure, you've no family homes, you have, you know, essentially a very transient kind of um, development that's built there just to maximise profits. The construction industry argues that large-scale developments are needed to meet current demand and that objections are part of the reason supply of housing is so low. But the locals here say they are not against development, and they argue that the SHD process has set back housing development instead of speeding it up. The plan is that there's going to be a six-storey apartment block, and then behind that, a 16-storey apartment block. Our nine tiny cottages are totally enveloped by this development. Since its inception, the Strategic Housing Development legislation has been marred by controversy because it bypasses local authorities by allowing direct applications to onboard Planola. That has meant that in the absence of a formal appeals mechanism, many of these SHD developments have been challenged in the courts and are under judicial review. We immediately had to learn what a judicial review was, we had to try and find a legal team who would take it on, which is very difficult when they're taking on a big developer and they're taking on Dublin City Council, and you have to then look at the bill, and the bill is like 40,000 to 80,000 euros to get the judicial review up and running. Luckily, the community really rallied behind us, and we've got to where we are now. Currently, they are awaiting a ruling from the European Court of Justice after it was referred there by the High Court. Research shows that of the 64,000 planning permissions approved under SHD legislation, only 14% have begun construction. The SHD planning system is set to be replaced 
as the government has approved a bill that will see a new system that restores power back to the local authorities. The Department of Housing claims that this will provide greater transparency, clarity and improved public participation in the process. Only time will tell if this is workable or not. If height and density are key to the sustainable growth of our cities, then it seems obvious that the first thing we're going to have to build is a consensus among all those involved. But is it possible to build a consensus with local authorities, developers and residents to make higher densities work? Ireland's model of development has delivered mainly low-density, car-dependent urban sprawl. Building more density is a necessary component of our urban ambitions. So what does well-designed high density look like? There are places in Dublin, in Cork, in Galway, in Limerick, in Waterford, in other cities, or cities and towns around the country that can accommodate more development, denser development. I couldn't believe how high this actually was. I, I was just counting there. It looks like it's about 17 or 18 storeys, but it's very unimposing. I, I was expecting naively for it to be eight storeys. High buildings can work in certain contexts. And I mean, the development I, I here in Docklands, it integrates both living environment, working environment. We have leisure facilities, um, restaurants, shops. And that was all planned, you know, as part of the process for, of, of Docklands development. The Docklands transition from a wasteland only a few years ago to being almost completely built out is remarkable. But I'm curious to know what it's like to live here. It's a really good urban environment, um, really good landscaping, love the square. It's a nice kind of hard park. Um, really, really good cosmopolitan vibe with all the tech companies nearby. Like it's close to town and well obviously mostly in town and it's close to my work. It's close to the office. <laughs> <laughs> it's convenient. I hate commuting yeah, personally, do yeah. you? No, I don't commute. <laughs> well I suppose we want apartments to be attractive for everybody. If you think of a of a town or a neighbourhood, there's older people living there, there's young couples with families, there's a range of different uh, tenures as well. So we want social housing, we want affordable housing, we want private rented housing all of these things in make communities and make communities livable. But Paula, with the fact that we have a homelessness crisis and we need increased supply in our housing, does it really matter to bring the community along? Should we not just be planning and building homes? I think if we allow that to happen, what we get is a race to the bottom, that we would get a preponderance of one bedroom and studio apartments and, and build to rent so that we get something that is potentially profitable and makes sense from the, for the development industry, but doesn't make sense for building sustainable communities. We need to be thinking about where's the storage places for all our buggies, for our cargo bikes, for our, for our barbecues, all of these big pieces of kit. We need communal spaces for having our kids' birthday parties and so on. So all of those things get stripped out when you're saying to the developer, just deliver housing. So tell me, are there things about the area that you don't like? Yes. <laughs> oh, tell let's, me those. Let's talk about the how, the prices <laughs> oh, okay, of, of accommodation. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's yeah. really expensive. Um, and the places are small. I think once you have a family and you start expanding it, I think it's certainly time to look further afield. Paula, how do we then get this right? What do we do moving forward? So I think it has to be plan-led because when we have those plans in place we can look forward and see where's the best place to have our open space, where's our best place to have a landmark building and to think about where we need other pieces of infrastructure such as a school, such as a theatre, all of those other pieces that, that make sense and where then does our, our transport infrastructure go into that. And in some cases where we have developers just in an area in infill sites, developing single sites, we don't get that bigger picture. There are many elements to making our urban centres more desirable and sustainable places to live. An ambitious urban vision from Dublin Chamber is calling for changes in planning, with the aim of enhancing both quality of life and sustainability. 
Okay, so 15 minute city, what does that mean to anyone who's never heard of it before? What it means is that within 15 minutes of where you live, you have access to all the services that enable you to live locally and to a public transport sector that links you into the wider city. So you have things like shops, pharmacies, doctor, park, all these things that allow you to live and enjoy your life in that locality. And then you're also connected into the wider city through that public transport. So this isn't about making it easier for me to drive and me to park. That's not part of the 15 minute city, is that the idea? What we're looking for is that, you know, it's pedestrian first policy, it's active transport first policy, then public transport and then car infrastructure. And an attractive city, one that's nice to live in, that people enjoy, that's also attractive for businesses then? Yeah, the attractiveness of the city, the international, you know, how it competes internationally, its competitiveness, that's really important for businesses and especially, you know, businesses coming in from abroad, setting up their companies here, you know, what they view Dublin as, is it a great place to live? to work, to visit, that's really important for them. There's a lot of places that, that people live, they're quite settled communities, but they don't have the facilities that, that you would want in this 15 minute city. How do you make that work? Well, it's kind of twofold in making that work. Um, the first is doing kind of an infrastructure kind of audit of the area to see what they're lacking that you might say well this community actually doesn't have a playground we want you to include a, par a, a playground when you're developing that site so by 2040 there's going to be between a 20 and 25 percent increase in the population of Dublin so not only do we currently have a housing crisis we also need to figure out how we're going to get homes for all the, that future population in the city and, and density in that is really important and I think Density, a lot of people think height and they think, you know, massive apartments and towering blocks of facilities. But a street like Francis Street with over the shop living is also density. It's about facilitating as, as many people living over the shop, living in communities and using the space that we have in the city as best we can. I think it's time to ask ourselves what we really want from our urban centres. If it's a great place to live, rest and play with affordable housing options that are not so high-rise, then we need to get creative. This is absolutely beautiful. Do you want to tell me a bit about what we're looking at here? Yeah, well, I mean, standing in Belgrave Square is, uh, might be an odd place to start talking about trying to improve density on, uh, on, on inner city sites, but there's a lot of lessons that Victorian architecture in Dublin actually gives to us if we're just clever enough to start looking at it and learning from it again. And actually what we can do with modern interventions is make them as dense as most apartment schemes. A lot of people are telling me that you can't make low-rise dense. You can't make individual homes and houses dense for people to live in. How are you proposing that you might do that? As soon as you start to go above five, six, seven, eight floors, then the apartment scheme is more dense. And in a place like this, three floors actually can be very, very high density. So can you give me an idea of what this might look like? Yeah, absolutely very, very similar to the Victorian housing around us. We have a ground level apartment that has its own front door on the street. And at the rear, that gets a really, really generous garden, three times as big as the kind of balconies that you would get on an apartment scheme, say, for instance. So the, the overall amount of sort of open space is actually well in excess of the minimum standards that we would work to for apartments these days. In fact, in this particular version, it's three times bigger. It's still, to me, it's two dwellings uh, look, where's the density? How does that work in the grand scheme of things? Well, this is the clever part. Because we've designed out windows and overlooking at the rear of this, what we can do is we can put two of these much, much closer together, very comfortably, than we're able to with much more traditional housing. So actually, at the back of this, what we get is a, another garden, and we get another unit backing onto this that has absolutely no overlooking, no windows. We're very, very similar scale to what we've got here. Everybody has an own front door. Everybody has a kind of a, a garden space onto the street and so on. They're, they're familiar places. What would that be like compared to, say, an, an apartment block on the same area? Well, it depends where the apartment block is. I mean, if the apartment block is in a place like Docklands or it's in a place like uh, Pulbeg, for instance, where it is very, very high, the density will go very, very high there. It could be two, could be over 200 or 250 units a hectare. But in places like this, where your surrounding context is very low, your apartment building will only be maybe five floors at a maximum. So this could theoretically be far higher density than an apartment block on the same piece of land? On the right side, absolutely. You're not saying outright, don't build up? 
in the Docklands and, and, and say in the glass bottle side in Rings End, that maybe should be even higher than we're talking about at the moment because the site can take it and that's great. But the reality is not every site is like that. The vast, vast majority of sites are actually much smaller and have much more complex issues than those. And so the design thinking has to move on in order to address the reality as a practitioner, the reality of what the sites are, are what sites are actually available. Density lessons learned from our past demonstrate that we need more than a one-size-fits-all approach to urban infill. But with limited site availability in our towns and cities, inevitably we will still need to build beyond city limits. What lessons can we learn from past mistakes when planning for new developments? And how do we repair the current legacy of sprawl? What are some of the negatives about having this more dispersed landscape? It tends to push us towards private car, which pushes up greenhouse gas emissions. It also has impacts in terms of air pollution. Car-centric development tends to drive things like obesity. Um, and it also increases people's stress levels. And that has costs for our economy, it has costs for our well-being. The practice we've had in Ireland is that we zone particular locations that are owned usually by private interests. And developer-led means that they will pursue things that maximise their profit, which is not necessarily best for people, for the, for the pattern of development we've had. Ty, can you tell me some of the ways that we could retrofit the country to deal with the problem of urban sprawl? Key one is actually the spatial planning, that we start to increase densities in key locations. So we pick even locations where we can develop a, a, a new village, a new town centre with a significant amount of housing that's focused on affordability, that's focused on high quality of life, that's focused on providing the amenities and the services that are necessary. Another key part of this is how can we put back in walking and cycling infrastructure? So how can we move away from the idea of car architecture, that our whole urban design, our whole landscape, our whole geography is defined by the private car? Located to the west of Dublin, the suburb of Pelletstown has been undergoing the kind of repair that Tyg is talking about. When you first came out, it was only around about a year after this development started. Yeah. It must have looked very different at the time. Yeah, there was very little in the area, but it's like they put the cart before the horse. You know, they built the apartments and, and now the houses, and things are net, the, the services are coming in after the event. For example, there's no option for cycling, really, for our kids. As the local population increases, public investments into infrastructure and public transport become more feasible. So the school is there. We've got a cafe right around the corner. The boathouse at the marina there w was built, and it's a lovely amenity. We have a lot of transport links, really good transport links. The higher densities justified the building of the newest train station on Ireland's rail network, which officially opened here last year. It's a great estate, it's in a great location, it's perfectly located as far as I'm concerned in terms of the city and the city centre and etc. And I literally moved, sold my apartment and moved a hundred yards down the road. Um, into, one of their into one of the houses because I wanted to stay in the area and I just wanted a bit more space for the family and we have a brilliant community here. The development of this canal side village is forging ahead in spite of its early shortcomings and offers a glimpse of what sustainable urban development could be. Sustainable communities are welcoming places to live they offer affordable homes, schools, healthcare, transport and other services people need. A sustainable community is one of the best ways to address climate change. The question is, will we plan and build communities in ways that free us from car dependency and congested roads, while meeting the many challenges on housing and climate change? <laughs>